Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Victoria Jennings. I'm a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the director of the Institute for Reproductive Health here at Georgetown. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to uh, the second event um, in the Georgetown University's Global Health Event Series. We're very honored uh, to have a wonderful guest with us today. He realizes that this is actually the second very high profile event on mm -hmm. campus today. Um, I, I think as everyone knows, President Obama was with us this morning talking about a very key issue in the global arena, which is to say energy policy. Um, and Dr. Jonathan Quick, uh, from Management Sciences for Health is here to talk with us about an equally important topic, uh, health system strengthening in action, the tipping point for global health, addressing issues about what will it take to ensure good health for the poorest people in the world, what is a strong health system, and can the vision of universal coverage drive health system strengthening? These are key topics, um, not only uh, globally, but here in the U.S. as well. So I think we'll all find this, is this presentation today to be quite interesting. I have the honor to, of um, having been asked to introduce Dr. Quick. Um, he is a family physician and a public health management specialist, and he is the president and the chief executive officer of Management Sciences for Health, which is, goes by its, its initials of MSH. For 40 years, uh, MSH, uh, an international nonprofit organization, has been dedicated to closing the gap between knowledge and action in public health. With project teams in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, MSH helps public and private healthcare organizations to save lives and improve health by effectively managing people, medicines, money, and systems. Dr. Quick has worked in international health since 1978. From 1998 to 2004, he was director of the Essential Drugs and Medicines Policy uh, Division for uh, World Health Organization in Geneva. He is senior editor of Managing Drug Supply, the standard reference on essential medicines and public health, and co-author of the Financial Times Guide to Executive Health. He's written numerous other articles, books, and chapters, and he served as a long-term advisor in Pakistan and Kenya where he's carried out assignments in, Afri in over 25 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Dr. Quick is also a member of the Harvard Medical School Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. He is an adjunct professor of uh, public health at Boston University School of Public Health. He's a diplomat of the Ma American Board of Family Practice and a former fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine in the UK. Um, and he is also uh, in, uh, a member of the American College of Preventive Medicine. He earned an AB degree, magna cum laude, from Harvard University, and an MD degree with distinction in research, a master's in public health from the University of Rochester in uh, New York. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Quick to you, and, but I would like first to just tell you how we plan to, to do this. It's very simple. Dr. Quick is going to speak, and then he's going to take questions. Um, so I think we'll, we'll probably be about equally divided between presentation and questions. So please be, uh, be prepared to speak up. We have a, uh, we're looking forward to a very interactive session today. Thank you. Jonathan. Thanks very much, Victoria, for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, good afternoon. Thank you also to uh, Bernard for uh, Bernard Lisa for uh, helping to organize this. It's um, as you heard, I, went, I studied at the uh, Georgetown of the North, and so it's really nice to be here. I just I just love being in this setting. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, those that are here may be the ones that didn't get tickets to see uh, President Obama this morning, but uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Um, I, I want to start by just congratulating Georgetown for the idea of bringing together, and I, I think Bernard was a key part of this, uh, trying to bring together people from across the university, from, from, um, from the college, from the School of Medicine, from nursing and health studies, from foreign service, from business, from law. Um, I'm not sure whether all of those are here, but there's few fields that benefit from interdisciplinary work as much as global health. So that, that's great. Uh, as you've heard, MSH has been involved in health system strengthening in countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East for 40 years. Um, and <laughs> any of you who have traveled uh, realize that um, we haven't finished the job yet. 
What I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about our experiences in health systems strengthening. What happened to um, Lillian? Uh, okay. Well, um, we were going to we're, we're going to spend a little time with Lillian, um, who is uh, a woman uh, in a village in Malawi. So I want you to uh, picture a village in Malawi, and uh, we may see Lillian may pop up later in the presentation unexpectedly. Uh, Lillian has TB. She is taking care of her daughter, Evelyn, who uh, has malaria. And she's being helped by David, a community health worker. And um, for that simple interaction, that is the core of, of uh, health interaction. For that simple thing to happen, we need David, Human Resources for Health. We need pharmaceutical supply. We need the med the money to pay David and to get the pharmaceuticals, I don't think are you gonna try to make Evelyn appear? Oh, Evelyn. Evelyn. She's the second slide. Um, yeah, Evelyn's gone. That's okay. We can we can we can manage without Evelyn, don't worry. <laughs> they're, they're they're visioning, okay? <coughs> uh, imaging is a really a really uh, good way of, of, of progressing. So but simple interaction in the village, but it, it takes a whole system to make it happen. It takes the supply system, it takes the, 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 uh, the, the um, financing system, and it takes an information system, and it takes leadership. So what we're going to talk about today is three things that don't normally come together into one sentence, into one paragraph, into one presentation. Tipping point, health systems, in universal coverage. So those are the three questions that we're going to talk about today. In the year 2000, Malcolm Gladwell, best-selling author and writer for the New York Times, wrote a book, The Tipping Point. Several things inspired him, but one was a story that goes back probably to the 70s of a 19-year-old Micronesian teenager by the name of Sima who got mad at his parents and committed suicide. That one, which had never been done in Micronesia before in that sort of a setting, that started an epidemic of teenage suicides which went on for a decade and actually peaked with the highest suicide rate in the world. And that was a tipping point. He defines tipping points as that magic moment when an idea trend or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips and spreads like wildfire. Some of those tipping points are negative, like Sima. But some of them are positive, like the explosion of political and financial support at the turn of the century, at the turn of the millennium, for AIDS, TB, and millennium, uh, AIDS, TB, and, and malaria. Gladwell draws some um, striking parallels between infectious disease epidemics and what he calls social epidemics. And he argues that social epidemics are based on the bedrock belief that change is possible, that people can radically transform their beliefs and behaviors. And if you think about the dynamics of AIDS treatment scale up, on January 1st, 2000, AIDS in Africa was a death sentence. There was no global drug facility for tuberculosis, which comes with AIDS. No global, drug, no global fund for AIDS, no PEPFAR, no President's Malaria Initiative, no unit aid, no PEPFAR too. In a period of just six short years, $80 billion committed. On January 1st, 2000, George W. Bush was still governor of Texas. There was no Gates Foundation. The um, candidate Obama was just about to lose against um, uh, Bobby Rush in his first bid for Congress, Bono was mostly just singing Irish rock songs. It really was amazing, and this this incredible scale up. So this is an example of a tipping point and, and and a positive one. So the question is, are we on the verge of another tipping point? We've just come through a decade, an amazing decade of unprecedented financial support. 
intensive disease-specific efforts. And I wish Mark Dibel was here, because we, uh, who was really the, 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 uh, uh, the father of, of PEPFAR, of the President's um, AIDS program, in terms of really making it, ha it happen. And it was based on an emergency response, which I think was actually the right thing. We can come back to why that was the right choice and why that wasn't the only choice. We've entered a completely different decade, economic diversity. Some of you are probably familiar with uh, Steve Radlett's new book, An Economist, um, based here in Washington. 16 African tigers that have grown steadily over the last 25 years and, and are on the way. Africa, contrary to what <laughs> some of our colleagues in Congress think, Africa is not a country. I mean, it is a continent with, with 50 countries. So we're in a period of economic diversity. Also, demographic and epidemiologic transition. With immunization and AIDS treatment, people are getting older, and the, the epidemiology, epidemiology is changing. As you may know, in September, there's a major meeting on noncommunicable diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, chronic lung disease. Those conditions kill more people in poor countries than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. Cervical cancer alone, which is mostly preventable, we, we, we believe, some controversy about scaling that up, but basically there's a vaccine. Cervical cancer alone kills more women than maternal mortality, 400,000 versus 350,000 or so, but we hardly ever talk about it. So the epidemiology is, is shifting. We're seeing a health systems response and a much more of a focus. So the question is, are we on the verge of another tipping point in global health, given the new decade that we're in? Let's talk for a minute about what creates a strong health system. In the 20 minutes, I won't uh, pretend to provide a complete explanation. The U.S. has been trying to figure it out for a century, and we, we haven't got it figured out yet. But I'm going to take three examples from Afghanistan, an example of the power of a driving vision. From Rwanda, the uh, impact of a focus on performance. From Tanzania, responsiveness to local realities. Ah, okay. <laughs> I knew Lillian would pop up somewhere. Uh, <laughs> this, is part of, this is part of teamwork. Uh, and obviously, the last hands on this thought Evelyn belonged here. But you've heard about Evelyn, and you've heard about all of these different things. So, um, Afghanistan. When the Taliban were chased out of Kabul in December 2001, the health system was in shambles. Less than 10% access to primary health care. Less than 20% immunization. Essentially, no female health workers active in any public health setting. Half of the hospitals in, in Afghanistan didn't have both running water and electricity. Imagine trying to do emergency surgery or do a delivery with no electricity and running water. One out of four children died before the age of five. Life expectancy was 47 for men, 45 for women. And nine out of 10 women were on their own for labor and delivery with no trained birth attendant, nine out of 10. You can imagine that the maternal child and infant mortality rate was among the highest in the world. A few short years later, through an effort by the Afghan Ministry of Public Health, the uh, US Agency for International Development, MSH, other groups like uh, JPIGO, uh, based up, up in Baltimore, there was a huge scale up. And through a network of 29 Afghan and international NGOs, by, the, by 2006, there were over 330 hospitals active, over 3,500 community health centers, uh, community health posts active. In just 13 provinces, about a third of the country, S seven and a half million people treated or, or served by that, half million patient visits a year. And you can see that um, contraceptive prevalence in just those two years almost doubled, births attended by a skilled uh, birth attendant, children f fully immunized, and it's kept going since then. Independently measured by Johns Hopkins, under five mortality in, in just a matter of four years was down by a quarter. Infant mortality down by 22%, saving roughly 20,000 children's lives a year 
uh, an unknown number of maternal lives. And along the way, by the way, husbands, brothers uh, treated for tuberculosis and other things. How was this scale up achieved in basically four or five years? What happened in those years? The international health community, the Afghan health professionals, didn't know any more about public health or treating any of these conditions in 2006 than they did in 2003 when the scale-up started. The difference was health systems in action. The first thing was a vision. This is Dr. Mohammed Amin Fatimi. Dr. Fatimi, back in the 80s, we worked with in Peshawar, Pakistan. He started an institute of public health. Public health was in his blood. He understood what it, was, what, it, what it was to try to provide services for an entire population. So he supported a strategy that was based on an essential package of health services and a basic, pa uh, 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 basic package of health services combined with an essential package of hospital services. I always wondered how they decided which was basic and which was essential, but <laughs> they kept straight. One was for the uh, general health care and one was for hospitals. But it was based on what, what is the highest impact package of interventions that we should make available everywhere in the country. And in these few, uh, few years, we got from 10 percent coverage for primary care services to over 60 percent. Because of that vision, it's tempting for people coming into a new government, a, a remerged government, to, um, to build hospitals in the capital cities. It makes the governors happy and all that. But they, they had a vision for a health system that was a basic health system for high impact services that could be scaled to the whole population. The other thing was a real focus on human resources for health. One of the things that happens in fragile states, in states where governments have fallen apart, is education falls apart. And it falls apart worse for girls, women and girls. Overall in the world, two-thirds of children not in school are, are girls, and it's even worse in fragile states. So one, but yet, next to national income fairly dis, uh, divided, female education is the single most powerful improver of, of public health. So part of the program was a literacy program uh, that trained eight and a half million women in, in, uh, in basic uh, health literacy. Over 6,000 community health workers, by policy at least half of which were women, we got more than half by a bit, um, and community midwives, back to this 9 out of 10 women being on their own. This picture over here is a community midwifery program in, um, in Bamiyan province. Bamiyan province, if for, if for those of you who are tracking it, remember when the Taliban were in, in Kabul. There were two huge Buddha statues, I mean huge, probably taller than any building in Washington, at least in D.C., huge, on the mountainside. The Taliban bombed those out. So this was Bamiyan. During the time of the Taliban, to take 20 young women to a training center for 18 months to learn community midwifery was unthinkable. When Dr. Shaher, the provincial medical officer in Bamiyan, had the first midwifery program, it was like pulling teeth to get parents to let their daughters go. The second year, he had to get the governor, who happened to be the only woman governor in Afghanistan, to protect him from the parents of all, all, of, the, all of the women in, in, uh, in Bamiyan City who wanted to send their daughters. It, because they got trained, they provided a service, they actually got an income, and it was actually the midwifery program which was one of the first uh, forays of, of women out into the workplace, as it were, after, after the Taliban. So it was, it was um, the, the, what made the scale up was a vision of universal access and then a health systems approach. So Afghanistan, an impressive story of the power of a vision and rapid scale up. But vision alone does not ensure health impact. Health systems in action must also focus on performance. Last year I was asked to speak at a national AIDS conference in Africa. And, um, excuse me just a sec. Sorry, I've been rushing around here. I was, the topic I was given was health system strengthening for sustaining the AIDS response, necessity or diversion? 
That was the, the debate that was going on among, among the donors um, and even within, within um, it was going on between different parts of the U.S. donor community. And there was a sense that you either put money into results or you put money into systems, but it was an either or. It's not. It's, it's an and both. It, 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 it has to be um, any kind of, of service that's delivered depends on a, on a functioning health system. The question is, is it going to be efficiently functioning and high performance, or is it not? So the whole, from our point of view, the ultimate test of a health system is health impact. In Rwanda, for the first few years after the genocide, the government sort of was, was made unsteady progress. Let's put it that way. In 2000, Paul Kengemi, um, Paul Kengemi, he's probably, he's a, tall, he's thin but tall, he became president of Rwanda and he was a very performance oriented fellow. Um, he wouldn't have gone through all of what he did and succeeded. He had performance contracts for his, um, uh, for his uh, people in his cabinet and for mayors and all. So this provided a great opportunity for MSH to bring an idea that was germinated very effectively in Haiti over almost a decade of basically linking monetary and non-monetary incentives to services and quality for outputs, service and quality goals. And what the Rwandans did, they had a problem of staff motivation and, and really getting staff back into the health system. That was part of it. By policy, they said, we're going to have integrated funding. So when PEPFAR came and said, uh, we're going to provide uh, money for AIDS, they said, <laughs> thank you. But you have to put it in with all of the other. We're running integrated services here. And this was actually a game changer for PEPFAR because the, the Rwandans dug their heels in. Contracting for, with the health facilities for services. The basic idea of performance-based financing is in a health setting, a set of, of uh, an NGO providing services for a whole district or, or, or a whole uh, province, depending on where you are sets targets, what they think, what services they uh, expect to provide, monitors those targets, measures performance against those targets, and then receives some sort of a recognition for having achieved those targets. N and that's basically the, the approach. So the targets are both quality targets and service targets in a, in a well-developed performance-based financing approach. So over a two-year period, which is actually fairly short, you can see um, improvements in the, a variety of, of service targets, 2006, 2008. Increases 24% uh, for vaccination, um, HIV positive women using family planning, huge increase. And so those who fear integration, if you've are attracted all the debate about integration, particularly the family planning community and the AIDS who doesn't have money um, and is really working, doesn't want to lose whatever they got, and the AIDS community that has a lot of money and doesn't want to lose what they have, they're both worried about integration. But what this shows is, is that um, you can actually, uh, with integrated targets, you actually can have all the services benefit if you get people focusing. So it's neither vertical nor horizontal, but a, a diagonal or a synergistic approach. And the idea is vertical goal setting, disease-specific goal setting, advocacy, public education, accountability, but integrated financing, planning, service delivery, and monitoring. And, and that's, that's the approach that, that will lay the groundwork for universal coverage. The other fear with performance-based financing is that numbers will trump quality of service. And if you just get fo people focused on number quality, uh, numbers, quality will, will fall. But these are, on a 100-point quality measure, these are the quality scores over the same period of time for lab services, antenatal care, vaccination, AIDS clinic. And we saw the same thing in Afghanistan, where we set and monitored quality targets along with service targets. So the reality is that you can indeed increase quality and service. You don't have to sacrifice one for the other. And, and again, in, F, in uh, Rwanda, increases in attended births, immunization, a reduction in child mortality that went along with that. 
So examples of the power of a driving vision from Afghanistan and focus on performance from Rwanda. Health systems in action also have to be responsive to local realities. There's a great uh, Kenyan proverb, songs brought by foreigners are not long used at the dance. And it's really true. I mean, you have to have solutions that fit in, in the local culture. Out-of-pocket spending is 50% of total spending in poor countries on average. And the vast majority of that is on medicines. Typically, most household surveys in most low-income in, uh, countries show that when somebody's sick enough to get out of the household for care, they'll walk down the street and buy medicines at a kiosk or, or whatever. Tanzania, they saw the same thing. 40 to 60 percent of people, the first visit was to these Dukladawa Bariti, cold drug shops, which were the informal drug shops. Well, they were convenient. 95 percent of the population lives within five kilometers of one of these things. But what did they get? Typically, a small amount of a poor quality, the wrong drug at a high price. Very bad value for money in terms of, in terms of public health. So what, um, what the Tanzanian, um, what we did through a partnership, it's to lay out a program to train and accredit dispensers. A, a sort of a kind of a, not exactly a franchising, um, but uh, a, in a sense a branding, Dukaladawa Muhimu, essential drug shops, a training program and a certification, and it was done through a partnership of the Ministry of Health, actually the Tanzania Food and Drug Authority um, as, as one partner, the private sector, the owners and the shop, uh, shop providers, civil society, MSH is a nonprofit sort of source of know-how, and the funders, initially Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Danita, the Danish, uh, the USAID, and a number of different donors, the Global Fund also. So this was the idea. Most of the essential drugs were channeled through the government-owned uh, dispensaries and health centers, and sometimes there was shortage. But you cannot provide every essential drug. There must be another outlet. This challenge we face is how to collaborate effectively with the private sector to ensure that these services reach all the way to the villages. On the 11th of August 2003, the Adder project was launched in Songaya. Margaret Endegondamondo is the head of the Tanzanian Food and Drug Administration. And she is, talk about local ownership, she's absolutely passionate about these arrows. And, and she, the Clinton Foundation try, came in and tried to do sort of arrows light without the training and all that, and she just put them dead stop. She really uh, has stuck in on the standards, and the result of that has been a, a significant public health impact. These sort of drug seller programs have been around for 20 or 30 years. Most of them uh, get co-opted by people who want to teach these folks how to arrange the shelves and what the laws are, as opposed to the public health part of it. So what they've done here in Tanzania is made sure that the products and the know-how for safe dispensing, appropriate advice, correct referral is there for diarrheal disease with, with oral rehydration salts and zinc, for uh, acute respiratory infection, sort of treating the symptoms we're referring, for malaria. Uh, for uh, pregnant mothers, they can bring waivers and get bed nets, get bed nets for their children, anti-malarials, family planning, safe delivery kits. They're being used for, uh, uh, for uh, community-based AIDS palliative care. Tanzania is great at curing uh, tuberculosis, but awful at di diagnosing it, at picking it up. So these shop owners see people with chronic cough. So it's been an amazing uh, public health effect. Increasing availability, appropriate use. This is adherence to anti-malarial guidelines from 6% to 30%. Still got a ways to go. Unregistered drugs, basically from a quarter to less than 2% and improvements in affordability. 
over 3,300 dispensers. It started in the south of the country in Ravuma, then picked up in other districts, and now it's on the way to becoming uh, national. This is uh, Frida Comba. She's an Addo owner and, and medicine dispenser. The Addos are owned by individuals, by families, by businessmen, by churches. Interestingly, 90% of the shop owners are, are women, and it's been a great source of, of rural employment. Some great stories about how, how the income from this is used, not just to take care of families, but for school fees. So a, a program that really benefited from being responsive to local realities. So the third question, we've, we've looked at driving vision in Afghanistan, performance in Rwanda, local realities in Tanzania, and the question is, are we at a tipping point to universal health coverage? Judith Roden, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation at a, uh, the first uh, global symposium on health services research in uh, Montreux last November, to measurably improve the health status and financial resilience of the poor, we need to build a global movement in support of universal health coverage. Health systems reform is an integral part to that. Her point about the financial resilience of the poor, health expenditures in poor countries are one of the leading causes for impoverishment. And there's, rough, there's over a billion Poor, of the poorest people who are basically excluded from health care because of the cost of, of, of getting that health care in the environments that they're working in, that they're living in. The 2010 World Health Report, just released last November, was on health systems financing path to universal coverage. So what is universal coverage? This is, a, this is a formulation, pretty basic, but, but the essence, from a 2005 World Health Assembly resolution. Let me say a, a couple words about the World Health Assembly, because people have different ideas about these different UN organizations. The World Health Assembly is basically an assembly of 120 ministers of health, secretaries of health and human services. It's the Kathleen uh, Sibelius's of, of the world. So these are the people who collectively have a responsibility for the health policies of close to 7 billion people right now. So they committed to the idea of universal coverage. That idea is core in health as a human right. Health is a progressive right. Within human, human rights and the, the international conventions, there are absolute rights like freedom of speech. You either have it or you don't. Government should be able to assure that. Health, the international conventions ar around human rights don't say you have to instantly provide health to everybody. You can't provide health. They don't even say you have to instantly provide health care, but it, it needs to be progressive. So this com commitment to universal coverage is starting to take hold in Thailand, in Mexico, in Ghana, and in a number of other countries. And we would argue that universal access is the ultimate test of a health system effectiveness, efficiency, integration, and ultimately health impact. So <laughs> now Evelyn is back where she, Lillian is back where she's supposed to be. Um, health systems in action can work for Lillian in Malawi if we have a commitment to universal coverage. Lillian uh, is going to grow old, and Evelyn is going to grow up. In an, in an environment where the disease pattern is different, where the needs are different, if we keep piling on these individual mega funds for diseases as we sort of they catch on, we're, ne we're never going to catch up. We're never going to be there. We have the, in this year of non-communicable diseases. We have people want to start funds for cancer, funds for heart disease. If the Martians came and landed in Washington and said, you know, we see that the U.S. has a big problem with heart deaths. And it's because you have a problem with high blood pressure and you have a problem with diabetes and you have a problem with cholesterol. 
and, and we're going to start the, the Galactic Heart Disease Fund for the U.S., and we'll provide all this stuff. We'll set up a separate supply system for the high blood pressure medicines and a separate supply system for the diabetes medicines and the separate supply system for the cholesterol medicines, and we'll have the labs and services and all that, and, it, 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 and, it's, and we won't charge anything for it. We'd take the Martians and we'd put them back on the ship and we'd send them back and we'd say, we don't have enough people to do that. We don't have enough health workers to do that. We want, a, we want an integrated system. Uh, the U.S. has the least integrated system, but we do have family doctors and we do have a more integrated system. But that's what we've done with these, these different mega funds. It was a great thing for the decade to show you can make a difference. But moving ahead, we need um, universal coverage that really brings it together health system working at all levels, from the household to the community to the hospital. People who talk about a community system and, and, and a health system, and when they th say the health system, they mean the, the buildings, the clinics, the facilities. No, that's two systems. System comes from the Greek, two words, to the Latin, the English, meaning stand together. And so it's got to be one system. So all levels working together, all sectors. We've seen public sector, private sector, civil society. That makes a health system. Health systems based on the best evidence, high impact interventions, and finally really locally owned in a sustainable way. Malcolm Gladwell, back to the tipping point. He says, in the end, tipping points are a reaffirmation of the potential for change and the power of intelligent action. Look at the world around you. It may seem like an immovable, implacable place. It is not. With the slightest push in just the right place, it can be tipped. Think about where the world was in January 2000. AIDS was a death sentence in Africa. And look at what's happened in just a few short years. So what do you think? Are, are we on a tipping point? My money's actually with the youth vote. And before I open up for discussion, I want to share one last clip. I, this is um, one of the programs that we do a lot of. One of the, the key in the health system, we talked about vision and leadership. And um, after the earthquake, we were working with uh, youth in, in uh, Haiti and going through the uh, leadership training program, which is a very empowering program. We can talk about the different mindset there. But they really got into it, and they actually did a wrap around the leadership program. I, I will apologize for the subtitles. They're not all great, but uh, I just want to share a little bit of this with you. Three. This is for the future. Three. This is for the future. Wolfgang, future master. Wolfgang, get more. Chaque ça c'est pour tout jeune dans moment. Apprendre lever des défis. Those guys, there's actually a series that, uh, Crystal, do you remember the name of the, the what's going to be on YouTube? Um, Okay. And they, um, um, they're part of a series of groups that are doing a, a, a tune on YouTube that is generating uh, money for, to go to Haiti for youth in Haiti. So, so um, thank you. I guess, Victoria, we're open for questions, however, however you want to do it. Uh, thank you for, for listening. Um, Shy people, I'll ask you some questions. I was at, I, one thing I was gonna, I had thought about doing was um, asking folks to draw a picture of a health system. I, I actually did that at the, we have new um, staff uh, orientation at MSH, 
And um, I asked them to draw a picture of MSH Be because it's, I mean, we're, we're uh, 2,200 people in 30 countries from, who uh, hail from 70 different countries. And so it's hard to sometimes to get a common image. And it was fascinating what people came up with as pictures. So you can go away and think about how you would draw a health system. So questions, reactions? One one of the the one concern about that um, is um, that the the is that the time of going to use the health services doesn't have a value. Paul, Paul Farmer, who heads the department that I'm in, always talks about this thing that people have the idea that poor people don't have a value for time. Actually, their time is the most value because they they they're trying to do one thing and another with it. But um, yeah, there's the, the overuse of services is is a concern. And there are different sorts of, of um, measures that are used in terms of co-payments and that sort of thing, waiting lists. And the reality is that every service controls the volume of people coming in. And they control it with either weights, with co-pays, with extra costs, with poor quality. <laughs> or with, or, or, so um, I, I think that um, the idea of overuse use when it's covered is there. but um, with the right combination of policies that fits the local situation, that's generally controllable. Um, I mean, it, you got it's trial and error to do that, but it, but it's generally controllable. The other th question about the different financing sources, it's interesting. One, I didn't talk much about. Uh, I showed the logo, but didn't talk much about the uh, joint learning network. The Rockefeller Foundation has uh, set up a network of countries that are involved in universal health coverage. Countries, uh, Thailand, Ghana, other countries, and it's interesting to look at those because what you see is each country who's a, that is aspired to universal coverage has done it with a different quilt of financing mechanisms. So this public, private, out of, paying for insurance, uh, revenue and taxes, um, it's got to fit the, the, the country. And typically, it happens progressively over time. That's, what, that's how Thailand has gotten where they've gotten, uh, and Mexico has is, is actually moved more quickly. So um, yeah, there, there are definitely uh, threats along the way, but for virtually all those threats, their policy responses, none of them perfect, but yeah. One thing I want to just, as long as you compared the two, there's one slide I took out, uh, which I, which I, I actually love it. It's, um, it's a slide that, com that has uh, the U.S., Canada, and France on the per capita income, uh, per capita health expenditures, and those th same three countries on excess mortality. And um, there was in the head of the uh, India All Institute of Medicine, uh, Ramalinga Swami, famously said the goal is more money for health and more health for the money. But when you look at these two slides, the U.S. is spending about twice as much, roughly, as Canada or France, and has 10 to 30 percent more preventable mortality. So that's basically the, the, the most money for the least health. And, in, in, and it's historical because Europe coming out of World War II, before World War II, modern medicine basically re didn't really exist. What, World War II was the first we had widespread use of antibiotics and, and, and vaccines and, and care. Coming out of World War II, Europe and Canada in that tradition said we want to provide basic social services to everybody. And so it was, it was the high impact services. The US, our history is out of insurance and getting doctors and hospitals paid. That's a tale of two visions. Their vision for, for universal coverage, our vision was individual and uh, getting the doctors and hospitals paid. Both visions have been realized, but the different visions, yes. Well, the dialogue um, has been had by the ministers of health with each other in, 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 um, in Geneva, at the World Health Assembly, in their, in their local regions. It's a dialogue that is being, um, is being sort of stirred up by a number of different actors, including the Rockefeller Foundation. So they actually have a network of sort of ambassadors, the, the former um, 
I don't think it's a former president of Ghana, but former minister of health of Ghana, is out talking to people. Uh, Sir George Elaine. Uh, Sir George has got a part-time appointment at, at Georgetown, I think, yes? I think, well, okay, he's got, well, I think maybe he does, but in any case, you have a lot of, you have a lot of great people who have offices around here. You should walk around. Um, but Sir George Elaine is from the Caribbean, and he ran the, world, the uh, Pan American Health Association for a number of years, and um, so he's part of this group. So actually, uh, no, it's not, uh, um, um, it's, it's not the, the sort of technical assistance folks, it's actually, it's, there's a, a really a powerful network that's helping to get this idea around. Yes? Well, a, a couple of things. Uh, one of the things in, in uh, it's different in different settings. In fragile states where things are falling apart, uh, uh, Southern Sudan, Haiti, Afghanistan, where, when, the, when it was a problem. We, saw, we, pro, we took a two, what we call a two-pronged approach. We would work with whoever was on the ground providing services to keep those services going. And it was typically NGOs, but sometimes it was the government. But then also work with the policymakers and work with them um, to develop the, their ability to do the things that only government can do, set the policy and the regulation and all. And over more than a decade, in Haiti, for example, the service delivery marched on. And there were parts of Haiti that were getting immunization rates as good as some of the parts of the U.S., like Oklahoma and Alaska. The government was in and out. Sometimes there was just nobody home at the Ministry of Health. But there were lots of Haitians who were getting a picture of what a health system looks like. One of the reasons why Afghanistan was able to scale up so quickly, I, I didn't point out in, in the other picture there, one of the people around in the picture down here was somebody who had been a vaccinator back in the 60s, 70s with MSH and had, was now a community health worker. So what happens is, and, and the reason why that scale up happened was because there were people who got the picture, who knew what it looked like, and when the time was right, then they could, they could really take off and develop the health system. We have seen uh, part uh, in our in our um, leadership development program. It's based on the idea you you can develop leadership, but in teams over time in your own workplace by facing real challenges. And we've seen people really light up. Th there's a, a a nurse in, in Nigeria. Nigeria is is an incredibly vibrant country with a lot of really sharp people, but it's it's often a tough place to get things going. She came to one of these leadership development programs, and she went back and totally changed the hospital. You know, she, by by um, the combination of having an approach and, and the opportunity. So um, you can always save lives, no matter with leadership or without, if you get in and sort of do it. But one, once people get the plot, then the, when you get somebody who really wants to move, they they can move. Another question, Victoria, and then one in the back. Okay. Okay, yeah, go ahead. W one was that he could articulate it, and you really felt it. A and there have been several ministers of health that, that uh, many that have, have had that. I don't know whether you've had a chance to hear uh, Dr. Tedros from Ethiopia, but he's also somebody who's really got the passion. And one of the former ministers of health uh, from... Um, uh, from Afga from um, Nigeria, Babatunde Oshodeme, is now the head of UNFPA, and um, first time they've had a, I think a male, definitely an African male, head of the family planning organization. So these are all people who can articulate where they want to go, and it's usually fairly simple, and have a have a passion for it. In in Dr. Fatimi's case, he he was also just a very warm and gracious individual. And he pulled people in. That that's that's really that's really what it comes down to. Yes. In um, it the it because we do the training. One good filter is we do most of the work in countries, and it's always tricky when you're offering somebody a, a trip 
to the U.S. for a month or something, that's a, that puts a whole different filter on it, realistically. So we, we get people who, who are interested in learning, and they, um, um, because it's in teams and you can involve more people, it'll give a, it gives the opportunity for folks to stand out. We don't have any leadership tests. We don't have a personality test. We don't have a screening thing. And, and what's interesting is it is infectious. So it's great when you have several different areas coming together, um, different, um, uh, different districts, for example, and one of them gets the plot and moves ahead, and then people in another district say, well, you know, why can't you do what they're doing? So no magic way of filtering. Yeah, right, yes. Well, R Rwanda, well, one of the paradoxes of countries that have been through crisis is that uh, the health system is usually in a bit of a shambles. So there's often not much of a dysfunctional system getting in the way. The problem with trying to make change, I mean, in, in the U.S., we put a sixth of the economy in the hands of one industry, which is the health industry. It's really hard, as we, we've all seen. It's really hard to, to, to change when you've got all of that. So... Um, Rwanda, there, there was not a lot going on in a vertical way, and so um, they were able to set a policy of integration and, and move ahead that way. A lot of countries are now trying to integrate sort of AIDS and TB and, and um, the, the different kind of program by program. And, and so there, there isn't um, uh, one pathway, but getting that commitment to do it in an integrated way. And it's simply, it really is just un, unaffordable to do it in a, a disintegrated way, to separate it all out. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, it is a dilemma. It was really interesting. The, the, uh, go back to this uh, 2000, uh, leading up to 2000, when we had this explosion of mega funds. The, the WHO cabinet paper that, that put together the idea for a global fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria actually had seven conditions in it. It had children in it, and it had maternal health in it. And, uh, and in December 99, that was the plan. It was actually called um, Massive Attack on Diseases of Poverty, but <laughs> the title of it went to the G8 in Okinawa in July of 2000, and it came back, and it was just AIDS, TB, and malaria. And even that wasn't set because Kofi Annan, uh, who's a wonderful guy and did great things, um, he was arguing more for AIDS. But the person who was sort of a key part of that, Yona Story, who was with the Director General of WHO, is now Foreign Minister for Norway, Jonas came back from, uh, from Okinawa, and, and, I, and he said, you know, AIDS, TB, malaria, and all. I said, Jonas, what, what happened? And basically, uh, and health systems didn't even get on the plane to Okinawa. It was just those seven diseases. And women and children got chucked off somewhere. And, and he said, we couldn't sell it to the parliaments of the north. They can get AIDS, TB, and malaria. They can't get health systems, and they can't get the whole package. But back in 2000, people were skeptical you could do anything. And, and I actually think it was the right decision to, to, for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria to focus on three things. Because we really showed nobody can argue um, that you can't do, you can't do major scale-ups in, in Africa, Asia, Latin American, poor countries. I mean, it was done, and it was done with people from the countries. It took political will, money, and know-how. So back to your political problem. Um, I'm actually... I think the idea of disease-specific resource mobilization, but then programmed in-country so that the, f w that the funding is integrated um, at the point where it comes into the country, so you get integrated financing, integrated planning, integrated service delivery, but get the monitoring targets. You report back whether you're getting um, the disease targets and all. It's worked for the Global Fund. The Global Fund, you got all the AIDS activists getting money given to the Global Fund, people interested in TB, malaria, um, but they don't really, the individual groups don't ask, you know, we're, they don't say because we haven't seen enough TB, we're not going to give any money. So uh, 
I, I think we're still going to raise the resources more for individual diseases, but it, they've got to be programmed in country in an integrated way. And it's countries like Rwanda who says, fine, we'll take your PEPFAR money, but we'll m do it in an integrated way. Victoria, I think you had a question? Yeah, I mean, I, the reality is people steal money everywhere in the world. All we got to do is go north a little while to Wall Street and, and we can see that. So um, say the um, accountability, transparency, shining a light, get, having it really clear and in a transparent way how much money is going in, prosecuting. Uh, one of the best, we, I was involved in, in a cost sharing program in Kenya for four years and one of the best things from my point of view was when the nation came out with a picture of a district medical officer, a doctor, on his way to jail for stealing cost sharing money. And so it needs to be just a steady, steady thing. First of all, we need to realize that, like I say, stealing money is, nobody's got a monopoly on that. And next of all, we, we've just got to be clear and courageous about, about um, monitoring and then um, prosecuting when it happens. Um, and it, deal, deal with it. The, the Transparency International, uh, some of you may know TI, Transparency International, which is the biggest um, NGO that's working on the whole area of corruption. All they got a whole system on corruption and health services. There are all sorts of things that you can do in the way you structure your health services to make corruption um, harder to do, easier to reveal. Um, and I don't take that in a negative way. That's part of this, this, that, I mean, we, you know, that's just part, <laughs> that's just part of doing business. And there, and there are ways of dealing with it. Uh, and um, yeah, we just need to do it. Yes. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I do think, I, I call that sometimes millennium fever. There was a thing happening leading up to the millennium. Um, what you had was stars like Bono. I mean, I was a little, little bit tongue in cheek, but, but Bono had a major role there. Um, Jeff Sachs, uh, economist from Harvard, not Columbia, very in your face, um, very, but, but, but great. We had uh, Claire Short, who was a, a blue-collar uh, uh, Brit who became Secretary of State for Development there, uh, who's a really solid, earthy lady, and, and she got behind it. Gro Harlem Brundtland, when she, former Prime Minister Norway, running for World Health Organization, went on a listening tour and they said, it's the money, stupid. And I think it was a critical mass of people who really wanted to see change. It was the AIDS activists. The, the, you, when you look at the barriers that were crashed for AIDS, it's too expensive, it can't be done, there's no money, you can't scale it up. Every one of those barriers, the common point in crashing each of those barriers was the AIDS activists. So, uh, you know, it, it'll be different this, yeah, Matt. Okay, well, I, ha I know the data in the U.S. The, the Gates Foundation actually asked that question a few, probably three years ago. And it's very interesting. Uh, for one thing, global health is actually a confusing term for the public. Um, is this environment? Is it the health of the globe? Is it? They, they really didn't get it. Uh, Congress was almost no different from the American public, basically the same. And um, so that was interesting. The, the, they were tired of hearing stories about people dying and what wasn't working. What they wanted to hear about was what is working. And um, there, were, there were a few other messages, but those were some of the messages. In terms of where they get the information, um, that, you know, uh, that, I don't, that I don't know. I think it's been interesting for me to see the catch, uh, the pickup on blogs. Uh, we were, this whole in, idea of integration, there was, uh, I think Kathleen Sebelius, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, was the first one to use smart integration in a speech that made it onto the web. And I'd done a, a, a blog on that, and I was actually trying to get the proper definition of, of smart integration. <laughs> and I Googled it, and, and she was the first hit, and I was the fourth hit. So. 
people are the blo whole thing about blogging i think is it really is it there's things spread in, in in different ways so and somebody over here had a question that i yes Well, I smile because we have, within MSH, we have people cluster around each of the different building blocks. And by the way, six building blocks do not a health system make. We think of the building blocks, but th nothing stands up. It's, it's, this, it's the vision that crosses it. It's the thinking all sectors. It's, it's the values. It's the policy. But in fact, we do have people clustered around that. And if you want to get an hour or two hour discussion going, you could go ask that question in, in one, of our, one of our global staff meetings. Um, and there are very strong views. My feeling is that the leadership governance management side is, is the beginning and the end. Because nothing, even if you get it started, it will not continue to work if you don't have um, a governance issue if you don't have governance taken care of. Back to Victoria's point. Well, I've been in phar the pharmaceuticals area since I was a medical student in 1978 and did an internship and went around the world and looked at those. You can arrange the stores, you can teach people how to do procurement and um, you come back two years later and unless you've sorted out the accountability structure, it, it won't work. So I really think that's the starting point. The most difficult one is the financing one. That's the, the, so those are the two key levers, leadership and management, governance, leadership, management, and, and financing. A combination of things. A lot of it is, is, is attitude. I mean, just... Um, and not being sort of arrogant or condescending, c meeting them where they are. Um, the other thing is, is services that are, are from the people. Back to this example from Bamian. Dr. Shaher, the provincial medical officer, he, he knew that if he got women from the communities to be midwives and go back to the communities, they'd stay and they'd be valued and be appreciated. He actually lowered the educational requirements, but he had 100% placement. Kabul Nursing School in the capital of Afghanistan um, had a 25% placement because it was all you know, people from, from the city that wanted to go, but they didn't want to go where the positions were. So part of it is, is training people from the community. That's why community health workers are good. And um, education, outreach, whatever people are getting, radio and all, and just keep steady at it. And there's nothing that sells the health system better than some satisfied customers. So it, it, it picks up momentum. And it's amazing to see the scale up when it's, when it's a responsive service. Thank you so much, Dr. Quick. Thank you. Well, thank you. This has been fun.